So my name is Gavin Keneally, and as Dave said, I'm a third-year undergraduate student in mechanical engineering here at Concordia. The TED motto is ideas worth spreading. And as fundamental a backbone as this is for TED, I believe that it's even more interesting if we consider this principle at the individual or personal scale. You see, I myself was very deeply affected by a TED talk. A few years ago, I stumbled onto a talk by Dr. Robert Full, a professor of biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Full was, and is, studying various animals like geckos and cockroaches to understand more about their biological principles, morphology, and locomotion. Dr. Full uses this information about animals for highly interdisciplinary projects where he works with engineers, physicists, mathematicians, you name it. This has had a profound impact on my life, and I'm now aiming to pursue graduate studies in the field of biosymbiosis because of this talk. I'm very pleased to be able to speak here at TEDx Concordia because it's one way that I'm able to give back to the TED community that has been so influential in my life. So I'm going to be talking a lot about a process called 3D printing. And if you haven't heard about 3D printing, I'll be explaining it in great detail, and it is pretty amazing. But if you'll indulge me for a little bit, I'd like to provide some context. So for the past year, I've been working on a prototype vehicle that's able to change the distance between its wheels while driving. So I, this work was done with Dr. Luis Rodriguez in his HiCons lab at Concordia, uh, where it's called an actively telescoping suspension arm vehicle. Basically, the point is, as this vehicle is going through, let's say, a corner very quickly, uh, you would think that the vehicle would become unstable and maybe tip over, so this vehicle can change its width to make itself wider or narrower as necessary. Going back to Dr. Full, this, the, the design of this mechanical vehicle can be seen as derived from biological principles. Let's think about an animal that corners at high speeds, something like a cheetah. Well, as a cheetah corners at high speeds and goes through a turn, they'll tend to sprawl out their outer leg to maintain their stability. They do this naturally, but as engineers, we can learn from them. So here's a video of my suspension vehicle, and as you see, uh, the faster the wheel, the front right wheel turns, the wider it becomes. So we're learning from biology, and we're, we're learning from biology, and this is, has applications in engineering. So this, this vehicle is thought to have uh, a lot of potential in scenarios where you have contrasting terrain. So think of something in the developing world, for example, where you have non-even infrastructure growth. So the same vehicle might have to perform in both a rural setting, where it has to be as compact as possible, and in an urban setting, where the vehicle needs to, to have very good high-speed stability. Because of this, an adaptive vehicle like this one can have distinct advantages. So let's have a bit of a closer look at the vehicle. Uh, as you can see, there we go. As you can see, uh, it has four independent suspension arms, which means that each set of arms and, uh, and wheels can move independently to the other three as the vehicle is going over bumps and things in the road. Let's have a closer look at one of these arms, and we'll take away the wheel and drivetrain just so things are a bit more clear. What we can see here is this is obviously a very complex mechanism. If you look even closer, you'll see that there are about 30 custom-made parts, each of which had to be designed, machined, tapped, milled, drilled, cleaned up, and finally assembled. Furthermore, each of these custom parts had to interface with selected readily available components, like gears, ball bearings, and over 50 fasteners. This meant that as the, the design of the suspension arm evolved, and you can see here, this, on the left you have an early prototype, and on the right is the one that I'm using right now and I showed you in the video. So as it evolved, because of the highly coupled nature of the mechanism, if I wanted to change just any one tiny little piece, there were repercussions for all the rest of the pieces, and the whole thing would often have to be remachined, redesigned, and I'd have to rebuy new pieces. So as, a, as a, the designer, this was obviously very frustrating, but even more significant, it represents a pretty huge waste in terms of time, money, and materials. So what if we could simplify this mechanism? What if we could go from these 30 distinct custom pieces, as well as lots of extra pieces, to two parts? Well, let's have a look at this. What you see here is a mechanism that can do the exact same thing, it can move in the exact same way, and it's based, and there are actually only two custom parts. So you can see there's the green part and the blue part. This is done using an intelligent use of material properties and can be accomplished with a suitable 3D printer. So you see we're back to the 3D printer now, so it's probably a good idea that I explain what it is. So to explain it, I'm going to take you through the process of using a 3D printer. To start off, you're going to need a CAD file. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. So let's take the blue piece on the bottom here, and let's look at the CAD file. There it is. 
So you can use this as an engineer. I know how to use CAD, so I can make my own CAD files for parts I want to make. But if you're not familiar with CAD, you can also just um, download lots of files freely off the net. So once you have this CAD file, you send it to the 3D printer's internal software, and the 3D printer will virtually slice this model up into a lot of very thin horizontal pieces. These pieces are then sent one by one to the printer, and it'll print them in as two-dimensional profiles out of whatever build material it uses. It then stacks these two-dimensional profiles one on top of another to achieve a pretty good facsimile of a three-dimensional object. So as you see, if you keep adding two-dimensional profiles, you'll get a pretty good facsimile of what your three-dimensional object is that you're trying to represent. So 3D printers have actually been around for a while. They're not really a new idea. Um, the first three commercial 3D printers were available in the 80s, and they were these big, huge, cumbersome machines that really, um, they were, um, obviously they were amazing technology, but they really weren't that great at, in terms of end use because the, they printed with powders that were very fragile. So sometimes you couldn't even pick up the part that you just printed without treating it beforehand. So as you might expect, over time, these 3D printers got better and better, and you can now print with a wide variety of plastics and even some metals like stainless steel. Uh, also, the detail that's achievable with these 3D printers has gotten better and better over time, and uh, the post-processing, which is basically just the cleanup, has gotten more minimal. So as you can see, over time, the 3D printers have gotten easier and easier to use and more and more capable. What hasn't changed is the price. 3D printers are still very much prohibitively expensive. They're so expensive that we see 3D printers only in environments where you have large research facilities or universities. Because of this, normal consumers rarely get access to something like a 3D printer. So we can see here on the left, uh, we have a 3D printer that I was just describing. It's a big industrial 3D printer. But on the right, there's an interesting little 3D printer that does fundamentally the same things, but is somehow on a desktop. Actually, I have a 3D printer, and here it is on my own desk in my room. You can see it printing a simple object here. So as you can see, this printer lives, as I mentioned, in my room. It's actually on my desk alongside my computer, my monitor, my phone, and everything else. It's pretty light. You can pick it up and move it around. And while it's not exactly cheap, it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, if you actually, if I zoom out a little bit, you'll see it's actually in my bedroom next to my bed, which <laughs> maybe not highly recommended place to put a 3D printer, but it's so flexible that I can basically put it wherever I want. It's also really interesting because the 3D printer not only lets you make new things with it, but because it's so open, I can change how the 3D printer itself works. So I'm not only changing what I can manufacture, but I can alter my means of manufacturing, which is, has really interesting implications. So I'd like to talk about 3D printers as not some fascinating new piece of technology, which they are, but as a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of a, a change that's an exciting change that's happening for active, active creators. Also, I want to talk about 3D printers, not from the perspective of some future technology, but from my own perspective as an active end user of 3D printers, as well as other forms of rapid prototyping. I believe this gives me an excellent perspective to see how 3D printers are evolving between these big, old, conventional industrial 3D printers and much more new, flexible, individualized means of production. This is possible because there are virtually no degrees of separation between all of the, um, all of the parts of the 3D printer. So when I use a 3D printer, I'm the designer. When I think about how to make the part, I'm the engineer. As soon as I send it out to print, I become the manufacturer. As you can see, I can have much more control over every step in the process, and this is really interesting consequences. So let's have a look at a more traditional manufacturing process. So usually manufacturing is linear and very, very slow and very fixed. So the designer starts off and has some idea of something they want to make. They then speak to an engineer who makes it more feasible and figures out what parts specifically you might want to use. It's then sent to a manufacturer, most likely overseas, who uses these massive factories to make whatever it is you're trying to make. A distributor is then responsible to bring whatever the product is all the way back to the consumer, who's a passive stakeholder in this process. All I do is sit there and get the final product. If we consider um, more traditional rapid prototyping, we have a bit of a more interesting situation. 
by nature, the product, the uh, system is cyclical. So the engineer and designer do get some kind of feedback. Although if you'll notice, the uh, consumer disappeared and we now have product testing instead. This is because, as the title would suggest, it's called rapid prototyping. It's not really used as a final means of production, it's only used in the prototyping stage. Now let's move on to the 3D printer. You can see that there are similar stakeholders as in the rapid prototyping phase, but they're all or more interconnected. This means that every stakeholder in the process can interact directly with every other stakeholder. So for example, let's say I'm the designer and I want to add um, an extra hole in this part. Before, I might have had to add, try and add the hole, then I have to speak to the engineer and they do some kind of stress analysis, then they'd speak to the manufacturer and they would make the hole and change the part. But with the 3D printer, it's not much more complicated than just changing the CAD file that I showed you and sending it out onto the 3D printer and getting the new part. So as you see, there's a direct link between all of the stakeholders in the process. This becomes even more interesting if we think about as a, a, the possibility of having consumers involved in this process as well. If 3D printers become prolific enough that the average consumer has access to them, they join this system as well. Because of the nature of the system, they're all interconnected once again. Um, and so when, let's say the consumer wants to make something then. So by thinking about something they want to make, they're right away the designer. By then thinking about how they would make this object, they become the engineer. By sending it out to the 3D printer, they're the manufacturer. By simply walking over to the 3D printer and picking it up, they become the distributor. And then by testing their final product, they become the product tester as well. So this is a very interesting shift, not only in the capabilities of the consumer, but in their perceived role as well. As you can see, they're much more involved in every step in the process. So they're more, much more likely to have to think about every step in the process and understand what's going on. So this is a really interesting shift then between the old model of rapid, old rapid prototyping or even big industrial 3D printers to something that's much more flexible. So how did this shift happen? Well, in short, it's, power in, it's in part due to the power of open source development. So open source, if you're not familiar with it, is a means of intellectual property where all of the source code or underlying blueprint is freely available to anyone. More than that, it's not just freely available, but you're encouraged to actually have a look at the code or whatever it is and tinker around and try and figure out how it works and change it if you want to. So some examples of open source that you might be familiar with are Mozilla Firefox, the web browser, Blender, the CAD software, and OpenOffice, the productivity suite. So I'm sure most of you have encountered these in your day-to-day -day life. But what's really interesting is that open source, the open source mentality, can exist in the hardware realm as well. So in 2007, the RepRap Darwin was released. This was a, a 3D printer that was started by Dr. Adrian Bowyer at the University of Bath in England. Uh, he also collaborated with many international co uh, collaborators because of the open source nature of the project. What they wanted to build was a rapid prototyping machine that would be able to completely self-replicate. So rep, rap. Yeah. Um, they wanted to build this, and so this was the really kind of the lofty, huge goal. Uh, as it is, the, the machine is actually very impressive and it's able to produce about half of its own parts, not including fasteners. But if we think about the real implications of this kind of project, we see that the, what I believe is really important is that it significantly decreased the barrier of, to entry for 3D printing in terms of cost, and it also, even more importantly, captured the open source community's imagination about 3D printing and 3D printers. So there have been other similar uh, open source mentality projects as well, on the left, you can see this is the MakerBot project. They're based in New York. And on the right, this is the Fab at Home 3D printer out of Cornell. So this open source mentality actually extends back to my own 3D printer as well. Um, when I wanted to go and order the printer, I actually ch chose to use the Fab at Home because I wanted to start off with a kit and then modify it accordingly. Uh, when I went to order the Fab at Home, they were unfortunately out of stock. So this would normally mean that I would have to wait until they got back in stock and there would be delays and shortages. But because this was an open source project, all of the parts list and all of the design files were freely available for me to have a look at. So I was actually able to, to reconstruct this complete 3D printer, not going through Fab at Home store at all, but by using alternate vendors with almost no time delay. This is really a tribute to the power of the open source community. Furthermore, as I modify my 3D printer, and I'm modifying it, I'm working with Dr. Paula Wood Adams at Concordia in her lab. Um, as I modify my 3D printer, I post my results on my blog uh, which finishes to close the cycle of open source creation. So this is really interesting. Okay, this Fab at Home printer is really interesting because they decided that the traditional uh, way that 3D printers work, which is with one extruder, wasn't nearly exciting enough. 
So the Fab at Home system, instead of having a single extruder to print in one material, they decided they want to print in lots of different materials at the same time. They also decided they wanted to reevaluate how we think about something like build material for a printer, so they used a system with a syringe and a motor. This meant that you could effectively print with anything that could be squeezed in and out of a syringe. So silicone, UV curable resin, you could even print with chocolate. So they fundamentally changed not only, again, what we can print, but the means of production. This actually has really interesting implications for how we think about design and engineering as well. Because if you can now think in terms of different materials, you you're, have to reevaluate your kind of design process. So this sounds kind of complicated. Let's take a simple example. So let's say something like a hinge. If I tell you to picture a hinge, you're going to show me something like this. So it has a pretty, pretty obvious predetermined function, and it'll do whatever you need, or it'll do its task pretty well. So you can see here we have a hinge, and it behaves exactly as you might expect it to. But what if we take one step back? What if we decide that we want to think about a hinge not as some physical object here, a pin with two sliding parts, they connect to a door or something with screws? What if we take a step back and try and analyze what a hinge does? So if you ask an engineer what a hinge is, they'll tell you that it's a one degree of freedom joint that connects two planes in rotational motion. <laughs> it's very clear, right? So, so now that we know kind of what a hinge is, would it be possible to use this multi-material properties to recreate this kind of motion? Well, if you see here, this is something that came out of my 3D printer, and it performs exactly like a hinge because there are two different kinds of plastic. Here it is. Um, the white plastic is more rigid, and the clear plastic is more flexible. So you see you can emulate the same kind of mechanical motion that you get out of a hinge with something that's printed in one shot in a 3D printer. So let's go back to that uh, simplified mechanism that I showed you before. What I didn't mention was that if you look really closely, both of those parts, the, so the blue one and the green one, are composed of two different materials. So they're represented by a lighter and darker shade. So the darker shade is a stiff material, and the lighter shade is flexible. This means that you can get the same kind of motion that I would get originally with mechanical things, like bearings and hinges and that kind of stuff. So you can recreate those joints using the intelligent use of material properties and a suitable 3D printer. So let's take this a bit further. Uh, okay. Let's take this a bit further. What if this, basically what we're seeing is that the 3D printer can reflect how we ourselves try and design things. So let's say I'm interested in sustainability. So I want, I've, see, I've heard about these 3D printers, and they're amazing, but I'm concerned that it might not be the most kind of sustainable way to make something. So if, you, if I talk to a 3D printer person, they'll tell me that printing in polylactide is awesome. It's perfect material, it's nice and sticky, but as if someone approaching this from sustainability, I'll know that not only polylactide is polylactide derivable from biosources, so things like tapioca and cornstarch, but not, but not only is it derivable from those sources, so if I need more, I just grow some more crop, but also, um, polylactide is completely uh, biodegradable. So when, the, when you're finished with the product, you can just kind of throw it away and put it in the ground, and it'll be fine. Also, let's think about local production. So usually, if you want something to be produced locally, you're pretty limited in terms of mechanical engineering. But with a 3D printer, I would argue that it's even the most local form of production you can have. So if you, cons if you consider the initial kind of hurdles of having to set everything up, you can see this is my printer on my desk. You see that every element in the production chain necessary for very local production is available. So things like warehouses and stock shortages and bureaucracy at the border, all of these become things of the past. So in conclusion, what is the future of 3D printing? Will 3D printers become so prolific that when we walk into a store to buy shoes, for example, they don't ask us what our size is, but they measure our feet and then print the perfect pair of shoes for each individual foot? Or can we take this one step further? Will these 3D printers come out of our research centers and labs and into our homes and garages? Does that mean then if we need to, to have a product, we won't think about, oh, I need to go into the store and buy it. We'll think about, well, how can I make this product? This will become a source of pride for us as makers and as creative people. So with this in mind, um, let's think about that. So we have this 3D printer now, and if we want to make something for it, we have to know all of the steps in the procedure to do so. This means that not only are we involved, but we're actively thinking about it. Don't you think that would make us think twice before just pitching something out if we know all of the energy and materials that have to go into this product? So if the internet and computers are a way to harness our creativity in the digital realm, can 3D printing become the technology that can bring this mentality to the physical world? Um, 
I look forward to future TED Talks as one means to answer these questions. Thank you.